Okay, let's get to the, what do you do with Oh, yeah. And listen, some people will say this is Stefan Roger's segment. <laughs> it's no longer Stefan Roger's segment. This is now my segment, What Do You Do With Wednesdays? Because Stefan's was always coming out on Thursdays or something, right? This so, is out today. What would you do Wednesday? Screw him, man. Okay, <laughs> well, I, get it up, Alex. Here, the, the idea one. Quads, you know I like to throw these at you. What do you do with... And I got two. I got a two-way question here with Bo Horvat. What do you do? Okay, that's for later, Alex. That's the. <laughs> come on. What the? We'll get to that in a minute. What did I just see? Don't worry about that. Okay. What do you do with the five-on-five lines when Bo Horvat is traded? Is it as simple as putting JT Miller in the two C spot quads, or is there something else you can try? Okay, so I've been thinking about this more and more, and obviously I'm team trade for picks, right? But when you look at the options the Canucks have to trade for. And again, the one that keeps coming to mind is Colorado, right? Like where you look at Colorado center depth and you say, okay, like that makes sense for Colorado to lock him up long-term type deal. You look at that and yesterday we were talking about how Bo Horvath's probably the best second line center in the league, right? They've got a first line center. They're best, fine. Best scoring. Yes. Two C. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Should have specified. Regardless, what I'm trying to say here is that you look at what Colorado has and you look at a guy like Alex Newhook and you're like, okay, well, and it doesn't have to be Newhook. It could be another team. It could be another player. What I'm more talking about is with this, with the quads plan that I've laid out a few times before is you're not looking at a six year rebuild. You're looking at literally, you're looking at turning it around in a hurry, right? You're looking at making good moves to get young centers, like younger players. I'm not talking under 26, I'm talking, okay, under 22, under 23 that you can see grow. Like, look, Elias Patterson's fantastic. We're still watching him grow as a player, right? Like, this isn't Elias Patterson's prime right now. We're watching Elias Patterson grow as a player. He's going to mm -hmm. be a better player in two to three years than he is right now. That's just a fact. That's what we're looking at with Elias Patterson right now when it comes to his two-way ability, especially. So... I say you trade for a center who can be put in immediately. Maybe, and obviously, he's not going to have the same success as Bo Horvat. But hey, if you look at JT Miller as some liability at center, have a young center who you can still grow. Because hey, even if you have JT Miller playing 2C and it works out, that's fantastic. This guy can play 3C for you. The guy that you've traded for is what I'm okay, hinting at. It doesn't necessarily have to be JT Miller or the other way. But if you trade for two picks, you're looking at... At having JT Miller as your second line center. Now, sure, but this the other thing, matter. the other thing, Chris, is how met how much of this team's problems go away if you make a smart trade for a a good young right-handed defenseman. Mm. That's that's where I keep coming back to because look, I, there, there's the been reports out goes there. Away there yeah. There's been reports out there that the Canucks would like a young center and a young right-handed defenseman back for Bo Horvat. They're probably not getting that. No, there's 31 other teams that want that. Yeah, you're probably going to have to pick teams one Teams are trading for Bo Horvat and asking for Luke Shen probably. They're so say, well, I want to write DT. I ask you this, Chris. If you have the choice between trading for a young center or a young right-handed defenseman and a first-round pick, let's say you're getting a first and one of these players mm. that can go in your lineup right away that you also believe is going to grow into a better player long-term, do you take the center or do you take the right-handed defenseman? Depends on value. First of all, sure. Of but course. let's say the exact same value. Yeah. Let's say both of these players, if they were straight up traded right now, would be worth a first round pick. Let's just say that. Sure. I think you're going with the right D. If you can find the right D to play with Quinn Hughes, who you know have you have locked down for a contract for a long time, you're going with the right D. If you can yep. fix that problem, and not even fix that problem, but like make Quinn Hughes better with your right D. And alleviate oh, some pressure. From absolutely. Quinn Hughes, right? I think it's right D and it's not even close. You'll, you'll be able to find a center. You draft centers instead of, you know, drafting wingers every, every year. You'll, you'll find a center at some point that can play yeah. in your top six. And specifically, if you finish really bad this year, you're finding a center. Uh, you know, I, I don't, it wouldn't shock me. Listen, so, if the Canucks finish yeah. in the bottom three of this, if they draft top three, they have found their second line center next season in any of those three. Carlson. Um, you got Bedard as well and Fantilli. All three of them are going to be a second line center next. Year. I read some really good stuff about Fantilli today. Oh, good. No, <laughs> no, don't. we're not getting into this. You know what I'm referring to. Yeah. Um. Okay. A lot uh, of prospect updates are out there. Right? Yeah, a lot of lot of different prospects. There's also updates. something from SportsCenter out there too. <laughs> 
So I think enough people have seen that on Twitter. Yeah. The replies um, are wow. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Knucklehead awesome. jumped in the chat and said, trade back for Mike DiPietro. Yeah. Hashtag Claude's play. You'd be getting time now in Abbotsford. Hey, right now. Team Tank, baby. Trade for Mikey DiPietro. Uh, um, somebody wrote about uh, Knucklehead said, go Penticton Bees. Man, Claude, you should have seen this rink out there. This beast, like, you know a BCHL rink. I know a BCHL rink. That Penticton rink, because I was there for Young Stars, that is not a BCHL <laughs> rink. There's like three rinks in there, and the stands are incredible. The Chilliwack Coliseum's pretty nice too. No, the Chilliwack Coliseum that's got three rows of seats and two and two of the rows don't even. No, work. you're making that up. It's well, a, what's it's the one I went bowl. to with you? That's that's Poirier and Coquitlam. Oh, Poirier, that one was tough. How do you not know the difference between Coquitlam and Chilliwack? <laughs> because I don't go out there. This is basic Lower Mainland geography. Mm. I guess you didn't grow up here. No, I didn't grow up here. I didn't do that. But you know how to get to Ab- Anyways, I'm not going to start this. Um, okay. What I'm trying to say and what I'm getting back to here right, is- I got as much we, more to get to here. Well, hang on a sec because I want to bring the conversation back a little bit. Because when we talk about this, you know, trading for a young center or a right-handed defenseman, the only way that I'm kind of in the camp of, well, maybe you don't need either and maybe you load up on draft picks is if you trade Bo Horvat, the sooner you trade Bo Horvat, right, the more your team is going to struggle to score the more your team is going to struggle to get wins. And I think we've both made it clear that the Canucks should do everything they can to not end up in that middle ground of being, you know, not bad enough to get a really great draft pick, but not good enough to um, make the playoffs, right? They have to avoid landing there again. And it looks like that's where they're headed, right? Like, it looks like that's where they're headed. We've seen this team just fluctuate all season long. 23rd is where they're averaging out right now. Exactly. And you have to you have to try to set some sort of definition of what this team is. And you made the really good point, Chris, that the higher you draft more likelihood, the higher the likelihood is that you're going to draft a guy who can play second line center for you next season. Yeah. Right. And I think that still works with the quads plan. So I'm torn. I'm torn there. Um, But this is a good discussion. Okay. Let's get to the next next one. one. Yeah. Who who plays the, but this is more of a, this year thing only then Um, who plays the bumper in uh, Horvat spot on PP one. When he goes, uh, Pod Colson. Pod Colson. Yeah, I could see that too. Pod Colson's done it in the past. Here's it the other thing, skill, like, and he could, started working on it. It could be. Call me crazy if you want. Elias Pettersson, and then putting Brock on the downwing side on his right side. See what yeah. Pettersson looks like there. Yeah, it could be. I don't know. Could be because like his his one timer is not what it used to be from that right side. It looks like with Pettersson, but maybe he's just finding it too. So we'll see. I, yeah. I would. I don't know. I'd try it. I would try it too. I like excited. that. Okay. I like that. Jack Rathbone. Is it time to look at the trade market with Rathbone? No, stop making these reactionary trades. Hmm. And I, I want to get to this, and this is for another episode, but stop reacting to things that happen and just make your moves based on whatever the latest thing you saw was. The Canucks know what they have in Bo Horvat. They knew what they had in Bo Horvat. And I understand the management regime was still new and they were still trying to figure out what they had in their whole team, right? And I understand JT Miller showed really well last season. But to not extend Horvat months ago, I'm not even just talking in the summer. Like, Mm. you had the chance to extend Bo for a while now. And look, I know it takes two to tango, but there was no reports that the country even looking at extending Bo Horvat earlier than the summer, right? Like... It, it kind of looked like they were making each order of business and taking care of one thing at a time. Instead of being able to walk and chew gum, it was like they were just, okay, let's do this. What's what's right in front of us now? In other words, it felt like they were living day to day, Chris. Yeah. And you just look at the opportunity cost, right? And um, the Penguins today made some moves that have given them $5 million in cap space. And people on Twitter are saying... Trade Connor Garland for a seventh round pick or future consideration so that you can sign Bo Horvatter so you can free up some cap space that you really want. That would mean, Chris, that the Canucks gave up the ninth overall pick, which is Dylan Gunther, for Oliver Ekman Larson and Connor Garland and a second round pick for good measure. And yeah, they attached those bad contracts, which were going to be off their books anyways in a year. So now, if that happens, And it shouldn't happen because that would be a very reactionary thing to do is to trade Connor Garland after he was pretty good last season at even strength scoring, right? Like you look at his point totals last year, like Connor Garland was good last year. I know I give him a lot of five. Hell yeah. Five on five. He was the Canucks best producer. He was up there. And to trade him now, especially for next to nothing, Mm. just makes no sense. Like 
I understand you want to keep Bo Horvat. I, I totally get it. And I understand you want cap space. That is just horrible, horrible asset management to give up so much, to give yourself Oliver Ekman Larson. Like, it, it's already looking like one of the worst trades in Canucks history, but that would put it over the edge, right? If, if they lose Connor Garland for next to nothing because they have to free themselves from cap hell, just awful, awful asset management. And I'm not only talking about that, I'm also talking about trading Jason Dickinson for a third round pick. You thought he was going to be a great third line center. It didn't work out in his first season. So to get out of the money, to get out of the contract, I know it was more. There was more to it than that. And it was for real dollars. You attach a second round pick to Jason Dickinson to get you Riley Stillman. Riley Stillman, Chris, yeah. and Jason Dickinson's cooled off. I talked about it earlier in the show. Jason Dickinson not hasn't turned his game around in Chicago. He's looking better, obviously, as a third line center in Chicago, and he's he's playing a bit better in Chicago, but. The point isn't so much that you gave up on Jason Dickinson. The point is just that you made another reactionary decision where something didn't work out immediately and you've you've given up on it right away. And again, it it's this it's this philosophy from this organization that it feels like where we have to panic because something's not working out right now. And hey, I I say, and I'm not I'm not here to criticize media or anything, mm -hmm. but I say let let the reactionary stuff leave that to the fans and leave that to the media. You as an organization, like the Gillis regime and the ones before that, and good organizations around the league, they don't give a crap what media or fans think. If they're following their plan and they're confident in their plan, they don't give a crap if you agree with it or not. What's frustrating for so many fans in this market is that it doesn't seem like there is a plan. Mm. And if all you're seeing is them making these reactionary moves, right? Like, Leave it to fans in sports bars to say they got to get rid of Jason Dickinson or they got to get rid of Connor Garland and they got to give him up for nothing. Who cares? Just get rid of him. Leave that to the fans in the sports bars. That can't be how you operate your organization. It's just this. It's it's this like never ending cycle. It feels like of just giving up when something doesn't go right and you you just uh, I don't even know. I, I don't want to keep going on this. You no, I know, but so do you. You know, I agree with almost everything you said there, except for when I asked you about this being about Jack Rathbone, because I think that Rathbone is in a spot right now where I don't think his value is going to rise. I don't think he's going to play minutes for the Vancouver Canucks when you have Oliver Ekman Larson and Quinn Dermott Hughes on back. your left side. As not, not even I wasn't even going to bring up Dermot. I just don't think he's going to be played. I don't think Rathbone's going to be played in the third, uh, third pairing. I, yeah, but... I would assume Rathbone wants to play in the NHL right now. I can also assume yeah. that there's a lot of teams that would like Rathbone to play for them in the NHL right now. Maybe not 12 teams, but you could probably look at 10 teams out there pretty easily and they'd be like, yeah, let's, we would give this, this, this young, like young twenties. Was he 23, yeah. 23, maybe 24 now, maybe 23. I think, uh, me and him share a birthday. Do you think right night. now, though, that Jack Rathbone's value is as high as it would be if he plays in the NHL for the rest of the season and puts up point-per-game point numbers once again? I think he did enough last year in the AHL for you to go off of that and think. don't think that he's dropped that much in value this year. Okay. That's as fair. a young defenseman, young defenseman who can produce, listen, if you're 29, if you're Christian Wolanin's age, you're a little bit older and you're doing it at the AHL, I don't think anyone's, like, swapping picks for Wolanin, but... There's a lot of teams. Like I, I would think of like, uh, could the LA Kings potentially be interested in adding another young defenseman to what they have? Because they already have the the very young defense. They have Brant Clark coming down the road. They have some other defensemen as well. Maybe this is kind of like the middle tier of like connecting your young players to what you have at the NHL roster right now. I think that Rathbone could get you some sort of pick back that you wouldn't be looking at and being like, ah, that's no, that's not been very like that's not going to help the Canucks move forward. Like. I would think at minimum, it, right now he's like, and this is just my guess, but like a third round pick. Yep. Teams would be throwing third round picks around, I think, for for Jack Rathbone. Uh, right if now. that's the value, then yeah, I see you trade Jack Rathbone. I think for that's a third. what he'd be right now. Yeah, and, 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 and it's unfortunate because I, you know, we love dealing with the kid. He's the he's the the most consistent uh, player that's ever come on this show. We've had him on, I don't know, a half dozen times. Yeah. Uh, he's one of the best guys to deal with in the locker room. I just don't think it's going to work out for him in Vancouver, unfortunately. So I'd and, be interested to see what happens here. Yeah, that sucks. But yeah, I mean, I hey, want to see him play in the NHL and have success. Absolutely. And hey, if you can, if you can actually get a third round pick for him, I, I, I gave that whole spiel off the basis that I don't think any team's giving up a third for him okay. right now. I think that I think that could be. If they do, I'm all about. for it. I'm yeah. I'm with you there. Okay.